shaped by science and technology. If you like our title, From Clockwork to Clones, you may thank tonight's speaker. It's his title. And we like it so much we ask him if we can use it for the whole series. <laughs> Michael Mahoney did his undergraduate work at Harvard and his graduate work at Princeton. Since receiving his PhD here, he has been teaching in Princeton's history department, where his interests have led him to teach history courses and courses in their program in the history of science. He's published numerous books and monographs on some of the giants in the scientific and mathematical inquiry, Fairmont, Descartes, Wiggins, and Isaac Newton. He's been particularly interested in the development of computer science as a new technical discipline. In addition to his day job at Princeton University, Professor Mahoney is a wonderful community citizen, coaching community swim teams, and I don't know if he considers this a, 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 something that was good or bad, serving a few terms as president of the Board of Education. <laughs> in fact, at one point, Princeton education was completely in the hands of the Mahoney's. When Mike was president of the school board, his wife Jean was president of the adult school board. <laughs> Who to do coverage? We asked Professor Mahoney to be the lead off speaker tonight to get us started on this voyage of scientific discovery with an overview of this fascinating topic. I think his title says it all. Clockwork to Kongs, Why the History of Science is So Interesting. Goes off to his time. Is this on sound? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Nancy. The jacket was on to start, right? <laughs> Nothing makes me feel so much like a dinosaur at Princeton than wearing a jacket and tie a collar. Okay, um, actually you'll notice that the title I gave it was from Clockwork to Clone. The issue of what makes the history of science interesting. Uh, I'm not sure it's up to me to tell you what makes it interesting. It's my job to make it seem interesting. I'm not sure I'm going to succeed. I've never succeeded in convincing my kids of it. Oh, Daddy, not another lecture. But I would like to talk about what makes the subject interesting to me and why it continues to be interesting after 50 years of dealing with the subject since my undergraduate days at Harvard. Uh, as I say, what you find it interesting, well, we'll see. So what I'd like to do tonight is start off where I started some 50 some odd years ago. Uh, the subject I started off was with medieval and early modern science and wind up with conversations that I had just a week ago at a conference on science and its applications dealing with the latest developments in computer simulation in Bielefeld, Germany, uh, which put a new perspective on a lot of the things that I learned as a graduate student and just a week ago to consider some issues about the nature of science and its historical, or its historical traditions in light of modern computer simulations, and I have to work my way around to that. So and Nancy said that you might show up on the 23rd for an exam. Um, this will be your exam <laughs> to reproduce this from memory. Um, what I'm going to do is work through um, aspects of this. I'd like to talk about mechanization and the way in which since the 17th century, beginning with the clock, we have used a series of machines as a way into understanding the workings of nature. By understanding the machines, by projecting those machines or those artifacts onto the world at large, we have sought an understanding of the world itself. I want to follow that through the sciences, but I also want to talk about the larger historical picture, that is the way in which this new way of understanding the physical world led to new understandings of human beings, of their society, and drove the mechanization of society as a whole. I want to work around to uh, the appearance of the computer, which I think it's both a culmination of that process of mechanization of the world, of humans, of society, of work, even of thought, and a turning point. That is, with the computer, uh, 
An old way of doing things is slowly undergoing change. Not so slowly in some cases. And we face a new situation where the computer becomes our only access to the world. And that may come as a cost at the cost of the kind of understanding that we derive from mechanization. So here on the side of this diagram, you see um, what I take to be, borrowing a term from J. David Bolter, Turing's man, um, the dominant or defining technologies of the ages, the age of the clock with the steam engine, the age of the steam engine, where we're not dealing with mechanical force, but thinking of the world in terms of energy and energy exchanges, and then with the computer, thinking about the world in terms of information. And information <laughs> becomes our model, or indeed begin to think of the world as some thinkers today, people today are doing, as a computation or a complex of computations. So that's where I'd like to, to get. Um, as I said, I'm learning all along, and to some extent, this is a, a work in progress. Uh, but let me see if I can get through this, and then we'll take up the, you know, I hope there'll be time for questions, and we'll take up um, any loose ends that might, um, might be there. OK, so let's start with the appearance of the mechanical clock sometime around the end of the, sometime in the 13th century. The clock is interesting. Some question about where it came from, whether we brought it in from somewhere else, whether the Europeans, I say we, but whether the Europeans of the Middle Ages invented it themselves. I myself don't think there's a lot of mystery. Throughout Europe, there were mills. When William the Conqueror took the census of his new conquest in 1066, there were 6,000 mills in operation in England alone. There were grist mills and fulling mills and saw mills, mills for pumping water. And if you look at a clock, it's simply a mill for telling time. And it's just a way of harnessing this energy source, driving it through gears in order to get uniform motion. Well, it's a little more complex than that, but let's not go into the details. The interesting thing is, mills did not catch the attention of philosophers during the Middle Ages. There are mills all over the place, but if you go into philosophical literature, no one talks about mills. When the clock appears, people start talking about clocks. And they start talking about clocks, I guess because of what clocks do, namely clocks track the motion of the planets. So they begin to think about the motion of the heavens in terms of a clock. When Johann Kepler was working out the orbit of Mars, He got an idea that he was going to do a new kind of astronomy. Not one that simply told you what the positions of the planets were, but one that explained why the planets were in the orbits they were in and what moved them. That is a physical explanation of their motion. And he wrote to a friend of his, Erwart von Hohenburg, in 1605, I mean to speak here in my new work of the celestial machine, notice the word celestial machine, not on the model of a divine animate spirit that's not alive, but on the model of the clock. If you think the clock to be alive, then you attribute glory to the work of the craftsman. In that machine, almost all the variety of motion stems from one most simple physical magnetic force. Just as in the clock, all motion stems from a simple weight. Oh, excuse me. Period. Just as in the clock, all motion stems from a simple weight. And I mean to call this form of reasoning physics done with numbers and geometry. Now, two important things here. Kepler is placing onto the heavens the model of a clock and wants to understand the planets moving the way in which the hands of the clock work because of unseen gears or something like unseen gears. And what's more, this is something to be understood mathematically. That is, to reduce this motion to mathematical principles. Now, Kepler wasn't quite sure how he was going to do this. His, his image was, he says, a simple magnetic force. And what picks this up idea from, from William Gilbert, an English scientist who did the study of, of lodestones, magnets. And the idea is that the sun is a great big magnet, and the sun's turning on its axis. 
and these arms of magnetic force sweep the planets, overcoming their inertia, because the original meaning of inertia in Latin is laziness. So these magnetic forces have to sweep the planets along against their tendency to slow down. Inertia will change its meaning in the course of the century. But he, of course, could give no math, well, of course, but he could give no mathematical account of that. He remained to work out that model in detail. And the person who did that was the Dutch scientist, Christian Huygens, who, now this is his clock of 1673, but his career was Essentially, some career consisted of working out the mechanics of clocks. Huygens was the first person successfully to attach a pendulum to a clock, to both to drive the clock and let the clock drive the pendulum. And whereas up until his invention in 1656, clocks were no more accurate than 10 or 15 minutes a day, his clock was accurate to within seconds a day. And with that kind of accuracy came the possibility of a solution of the problem of longitude. If he could figure out some way to take a clock of this accuracy on board a ship and carry it with you, meaning you were carrying your time with you. You set it to local time, you carried your time with you. And then it's always easy to determine what your time in sea is. You simply wait till the sun is due south, that's local noon. And now you compare the difference and for every 15 degrees, uh, excuse me, for every hour's difference in time, you're 15 degrees away from where you started. If you can design a clock, you can take the sea. And that was one of the main goals of Huygens' research. Now, I won't take you through the details. That's an entire lecture. But in order to put together this work on the pendulum clock published in Paris in 1673, Huygens undertook a series of mechanical investigations in which he worked out for the first time the period of a simple pendulum. Is, what is the period? It's a function of the length. Actually, it is a function of the length. He had to make an approximation because pendulums, when they swing back and forth, swing on the arc of a circle. So he asked, well, now wait a minute. I made an approximation to get this result. What would the pendulum, what kind of curve would the pendulum have to swing on? in order to be exactly proportional to the square root of its length. And he said it was an inverted cycloid. Cycloid is the curve you get when you take a, a wheel and you roll the wheel on a plane and you follow the point around. So you get a curve like this. Turns out if you flip that curve over and you put a pendulum on it, it beats out exactly the same period no matter when you start it. So if you put this ship on, if you put this clock on board ship, and the ships rolling back and forth, doesn't make any difference how far the pendulum swings out, it'll still take the same time to get to the bottom. That's the theory, at least. Not only that, he worked out the, the, the uh, mechanics of a compound pendulum, namely a pendulum, simple pendulum is a all mass concentrated in the point of, at the end of a weight of string, but that's not what real pendulums are. They're big bobs at the end of metal rods. He worked out the mechanics of that and a sliding weight, mathematics of a sliding weight to adjust for that length. He figured out how to get the thing, pendulum, to swing on that cycloidal arc. <coughs> that is, in the course of trying to solve the practical problem of how we're going to determine longitude at sea, i.e., how we're going to build a clock to do it, Huygens laid the foundations of modern analytic mechanics, which Isaac Newton then took picking up where Huygens had left off, and developed into a theory of the universe as an abstract machine. However, just let me point out where the story has those of you who've seen the story Longitude, read the book Longitude. Huygens' work is an indispensable mechanical basis for the work of John Harrison. Essentially, Huygens had worked out the mechanics. It was up to Harrison to work out the metallurgy in order to design that would actually, well, this is his first regulator, and this is the one that won the Longitude Prize in 1761. Okay, then we get to Isaac Newton. And then Isaac Newton, as I say, we have a study of the world understood as a, a, a complex of particles of matter obeying the universal law of gravity, that is, being attracted to one another by a force 
directly proportional to the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. According to certain laws of motion, he was able to show that you can predict and you can calculate the exact paths of the planets. Indeed, you can go out and determine the sizes of the planets um, and so on. And basically, he makes the heavens a clockwork. He provides, he completes the job that Kepler had started. But he also provides a model of science. He and, and, and as I say, picking up the fight. That is, there's to be a new kind of science of which Newton is the main expression. What kind of science of the world is that to be? It is to be mathematical. Ideally, we ought to be able to reduce the world to mathematically expressible relations and principles, and therefore understand the working of the world as derivations from mathematical principles. Set out a series of basic principles, use the mathematics to deduce what follows from that, and that should be an explanation of the way the world works. But of course, the mathematics has to be an expression of something. What will it be an expression of? A mechanical system. That is, the world is a great big machine made up of lots of little machines. And so one goes out in taking up processes one by one to try to understand what machine is at work here and what are the mathematical principles by which it, by which it happens. So you want a mathematical description of a machine. Now, these two criteria, mathematical and mechanistic, have the property that, as far as people in the 17th century are concerned, they make the world intelligible in the sense that if I'm presented with, say, a black box, and someone does something over here and turns a handle and a result comes out over here and I go, wow, that's amazing. And then you open up the box and you see the way the gears are connected and you see the levers and you look and say, I know how that works. I can understand that. Take it apart, I know how it works. Put it back together again. So you have the intelligibility of a mechanical system coupled with the certainty of a mathematical system. But more important, but, but, but in addition to this, the world is operational. That is, the kind of knowledge you have of the world, if you understand it in terms of machines, is after all an understanding that allows you to construct machines that follow the way the world works. So what are you doing in the laboratory? And laboratory science is a creation of this early period. You go into the laboratory and you take the world machine apart, some small part of it. You take it apart and you try to understand how it works. And you say, oh, I know how it works. Well, what do you have to do now? You have to put it back together in some form in the laboratory and say, see, it works, according to my understanding. Francis Bacon captured this view of science in the early 17th century in two aphorisms. One of them was a warning to the magicians who thought they could cheat nature, that they could bring about with the help of supernatural forces some result that doesn't occur. And Bacon said, no, 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 no. You can't cheat nature. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. So they'll try for magical effects, overcoming nature. Find out how nature works, and if you really understand it, you'll be able to do these things yourself. And indeed, that's the test of whether you know. Truth and utility, he said, are one and the same thing. If you can do what you say you can do, you probably understand how the system works. That's the purpose of laboratory experiment. I know how nature works. Show me. Here's an experiment. See what I've done? I can make it work. So the science is empirical. You have to go out and take the world as it is and start to take it apart. You take it apart in the laboratory under controlled conditions that constitute an experiment. The experiment has to be not only an experiment of discovery, but an experiment that demonstrates that you can do things. And because of that, 
it is built into this new kind of science that it will be technological, that it will have results that can be of use in the world. So since the 17th century, our understanding of nature has always been addressed to making changes in the world, to going out and working in the world. Our test of understanding has been our control. The goals of our understanding have been to gain control. And therefore, in many senses, history, excuse me, science, and what we today call technology, have never been far apart. Indeed, as you probably can gather from the way I'm talking, it is usually the technology that drives the science. As people discover new ways to make things happen, and then the scientists try to figure out why it works. I.e., as when someone said about economics, a mathematical economist tries to figure out why what works in practice will also work in principle. <laughs> but in many ways, that's the job of the scientist. To figure out what are the principles that make it work. Eminently the case in the invention of the steam engine. Working steam engines were in place, steam engines working fine. And only then did Carnot and other investigators try to figure out what are the laws that govern the working of heat engines. And having worked out those laws, conservation of energy, laws of um, entropy, and so on, then the world suddenly became a great big heat energy. The world became a huge system of energy exchanges. And we enter that second age uh, of a um, dominant technology that is the world of, of engines and thermodynamics. Um, and engines and energy. Now, so if, if what happens then over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries is the extension of that abstract machine of Newton's through classical mechanics, then to the rest of physics. To get a mechanistic explanation of heat, a mechanistic explanation of electricity, magnetism. And then the notion is that this mechanical model can be extended to chemistry, to chemical reactions, and perhaps even then to the life sciences and perhaps even then the psychology. That is, there's a model here, and I'll get back to this in the end of the lecture, in which the kind of world the mechanician has been able to build becomes a model for the world of the person extending, uh, investigating physical processes of an inorganic, non-living sort, and then slowly be, you know, becomes a model for understanding uh, the way the living world works. And so in the case, for example, of Descartes, Jacques Lemaitre in the 18th century, there's a notion of man and machine. And Descartes looks and says, what is a human being? It's just a machine. Well, a machine with a mind, but the mind is separate anyway. What do you mean a machine? Well, what's that? That's a lever system. What's that? It's a pump. What's that? It's a furnace. What's going on inside? It's filters. Right? It's a hydraulic system. So the whole notion is it's just a, mach it's a machine and can be understood in those terms. That should not be unfamiliar to us. We think of our bodies as machines. We even go in routinely now for spare parts. <laughs> and they don't all have to be natural spare parts. The modern, modern, um, modern techniques are a realization of an idea, as I said. It was clear with the card and the heart of the heritage is the heritage of this mechanistic way uh, of looking at the world. But it's not only the individual, oops, sorry, not only the individual who is a, uh, whom philosophers look at in machine-like terms, but it's also individuals living in the larger society. That is, if we look at the writings of John Locke and his contract theory of government, if we look at Adam Smith and his um, notion of the invisible hand, what are we looking at? We're looking at Newtonian societies. That is, just as Newton thinks of the world in terms of atoms of matter, with a certain basic property, namely gravity, being then governed by laws of interaction with other atoms endowed with gravity. So John Locke talks about humans, political animals, 
political atoms, as it were, with certain unalienable rights, the interaction of which is then governed by contracts. And the job of the government is simply to act as a referee in the administration of those contracts, is that the world works itself out because of the dynamic interaction. And for Adam Smith, you've got an economic atom. Certain wants, certain things to offer, interacts with other economic atoms according to the laws of the market, supply and demand. Again, it's a dynamic balance similar to the dynamic balance of Newton. And these are things of which the writers themselves were conscious. Now that society changes in the 19th century with the shift from within the life sciences with the emergence of a new way of working, a new kind of mechanism, that is the mechanism of Darwin's natural selection, the mechanism of evolution, where you get in the species that then work themselves out through the mechanism of natural selection. But now you're worried not about individuals but classes of, of animals. And it's more of a struggle than a dynamic balance. And all you have to do is look at Marx's theory of the classes and their struggle. And you see again, as Marx would admit, a Darwinian view of, of society. So the way we think about ourselves as a society is coming out of our view of the world as a machine, as a mechanism of a, of a slightly different sort, that is the mechanism of natural selection. So one can speak of 19th century Darwinian slash Marxist society. I'm not quite sure what to make of 20th century society other than random chaos. <laughs> um, you know, temptation is to think of this Turing society or, uh, in terms of the computer, but I'm not sure that works and what the 21st will become. Well, I'll get to that at the end. Now, one spin-off from the Development of the clock as a technology, it's important now, is the mechanization of work. Perhaps no development has been so formative of a new society as the mechanization of work. In the 17th century, into the 18th century, we use tools on a human scale to carry out artisanal practices. With the skill of a human, determine the work process. And human work patterns determine the pace of work. Beginning in the middle of the 18th century, one sees the development of various forms of power machinery, starting with power spinning, power weaving, power carding, and then one goes on to other forms of power production, in which the humans no longer use them as tools that serve them as adjuncts. The weaver does not use a power loom to weave. An attendant keeps the power loom fed with necessary materials, takes off the finished cloth when it's finished, repairs broken threads, but doesn't do any weaving. Machines take over these, pro these techniques of production these skills of production that were thought to be um, somehow uh, inimitably, inimitably human. Never, we, they'll never spin wool as well as I can spin wool. Oh, yes, we do. They'll never weave the way I can weave. Oh, yes, I can go to a machine and do that. <laughs> Marx observed that when the power of the bourgeoisie was to take away the mystique of craft skill, <clears throat> undermining the power of the guild master. Machines can do it. And behind these new machinery, or the consequences of it, humans become an adjunct. The machine starts off as an imitation of human skill. Let's build a machine to do it the way humans do it. But then there's a very there's an important fundamental shift, and again Marx points to it. At a certain point, inventors ask not how do humans do it. But how might it, what is the job to be done and how does a machine best do it? Example, you're going to build a robot. The robot's going to turn screws. 
Now, did you design a robot with a human hand to grasp, twist, unhook, turn, grasp, twist, unhook, turn? That's how humans drive skis. What do you do? You simply put an arm on that rotates 360 degrees. Right? Robots don't have to worry about that. So they just drive screws by turning 360 degrees. That's the best way to drive screws. Just happens that machine, only humans can't do it. In process after process, you can watch the inventor stepping back and saying, not how do humans do it, how can a machine be made to do it? And humans become that less relevant to the process. Because now the machine is not taking over their, their skill. The machine is carrying out the process they themselves could not do. And so you begin a slow process of automation start off machine production when the humans can't keep up, you replace them with machines. Now I started off with a clock. Why? Well, with the earliest machines, here's Richard Arkwright's spinning frame. This is what mechanizes spinning. And if you look closely up here, there's the gear work. If you're going to produce spinning machines on Arkwright's model, who can build them for you? Clockmakers. The clockmakers are the backbone of the industrial revolution. They're the people who build the machines. And because Europe has this infrastructure of clockmakers and small instrument makers going out of the scientific revolution, Europe's in a position now to start the mass production of production machinery for weaving, spinning, whatever process someone can design a machine for. And it's not only individual machines that are like clockwork, it's the very buildings themselves. You remember the mill? Right? I said the mill is like, the clock is like a mill, you've got a big wheel and everything turns according to gears. Well, there's a big mill wheel and here are the gears and the gears go up to the main shafts. There's a fractal quality to the, to the factory as it appears in the late 18th, early 19th century. That is, you have the machines which have a power source and gears, turning gears, turning gears, and carrying out, let's say, the rolling of the wool, the spinning of the wool, right? And then you step back from the machine to the next big level, which is the building, and what do you see? Gears and shafts, turning gears. So the machine, the building itself is a machine, and indeed, as a friend of mine pointed out years ago, in the early factories when they were powered by a central source, whether a water wheel or a steam engine, when people came to work in the morning, it turned the building on. And all the machines with it. Which is why you needed labor discipline. Which is why everybody had to be there at the same time. Be ready to start. Stay on task. Think about how that machine works. Put a human being and ask how the human being's work experience changes by being in the middle of a machine. Here's a later version of it. Henry Ford's assembly line. The ultimate in machine-based production. Where humans are just an adjunct to the machinery. Ford couldn't figure out a way to get a machine to do it, he put a human in there. As soon as he could figure out a way to get a machine to do it, he took the human out. Now, that's a very intricate process. So in the 19th century, all kinds of you know, the skill develops of laying out the process of production. So here we have from a study of Ford's plant in 1914, the, a flow diagram, production flow diagram, as an engine block comes out of the foundry and goes through the various machining processes that wind up with a fully machined block. And this diagram is key, this flow chart is key to the machines that are laid out on the floor so many of each machine so as to keep flow even. So we have this new skill of thinking through um, the production machines. I'm going to go back to the diagram for a second because I want to follow this a little bit further. Charles Babbage. 
great 18, the great 19th century thinker. Most people think of him, you know, his reputation now seems to lie in the area of computing his building of an analytic engine. But in his own day, Babbage was most famous for a work he wrote called The Economy of Machines and Manufacturing. He was in many ways the first management science expert, first expert in the organization of production. And it was that thinking about the organization of production that got him thinking about how would you take the techniques of division of labor and factory production and apply it to the computation of mathematical tables. And then if you can mechanize factory production of textile, why can't you mechanize the production of computation? And it's against that backdrop that he thought about a machine to do that, namely first his difference engine and then his analytical engine. And this is a drawing of the machine. By the way, it's never got built. And there's some question. Even though they're trying to recreate this machine at the Kensington Museum, there's some question as to whether one could actually have done it with the tools and materials available to batch. But what is interesting about this is this description. This is the engine at the center of the mill, which draws data in from the store in order to, as he put it, weave numbers by steam. <coughs> so we have here the me mechanization of calculation by a man, um, as I say, who's thinking about this in terms not only uh, of, uh, not thinking of this not only as a mathematician, but as an early expert, in, indeed, in what we today would call operations research there's another person who thought that way. Everybody recognize two people here? Yeah. Good, you're an old enough audience. <laughs> Can you imagine what happened when I showed this to a bunch of undergraduates? <laughs> These men, I say, shaped your world. Uh -huh. <laughs> J. Robert, the haunted one on the left, and John Neumann on the right, standing in front of the computer of the Institute for, it was built at the Institute for Advanced Study in the building that is now the nursery school down there. <laughs> this was the first and last piece of hardware built at the Institute. <laughs> there are reasons for its being the first and there are reasons for its being the last. The reason I show you this, other than to bring the computer in, I want to talk about, is I want to go back to Ford's production <laughs> flow diagram and set next to it one of John von Neumann's earliest flowcharts for computation. And you can see what a flowchart is. Today, that's where the term came from. A flowchart is a production flow diagram for carrying out mechanical calculation. So that 19th century heritage of the machine-based factory is very much in the thinking of John von Neumann as he was designing um, a computer for the carrying out of automatic calculation. Now I also want to go back here for a second to this because I want to pick up another line and that is the mechanization of thought. I won't go into great detail here um, but in addition to making the human body an automaton, a machine, Descartes, at least for an early part of his career, thought about well, what is the nature of our thinking and in particular what is the relationship between the ideas that are in our brain and the world out there? And for a while, he entertained the notion of, well, what we're doing is we're taking in patterns of light that pass through the optical nerve into the brain. And those patterns themselves are being stored in the brain and then compared. So we have a very mechanical uh, explanation for the way the body thinks. Um, the problem was that we also have ideas about things that can't exist in the world and he wasn't ultimately able to explain how we could get those from them. And so he gave up that idea and moved over to the idea that the mind is a spiritual entity and the body a physical one. Nonetheless, the idea um, that there are me mechanical aspects to human thought was picked up by Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, who designed the first calculator able to carry out all four basic arithmetical functions. 
addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. This is his calculator. Now, did he do this because it would actually speed computation? No, any mental arithmetic, any person with a mental arithmetic could beat this machine. That wasn't the point. For Leibniz, the point was taking up on a belief column at the time. The sum of human rationality is the ability to do mathematics, in particular arithmetic. What a wonder it is that we can get a machine to do that. Can the mechanization of human thought in general be far behind? <coughs> and he began to think about, well, what about some kind of logical machine that can do logical reasoning, similar to the way we do it? He didn't get far with the idea, but there's an idea that others picked up from him. Now again, going through quickly here. By the way, you don't have to be hearing about aspects of this from my colleagues over the weeks to come. So I'm going to leave it to them to fill in the, fill in the details. They can do a much better job. Um, over the course of the 19th century, there is a strong movement toward a physiological psychology, that is the explanation of human perception, of human reasoning, in terms of physiological processes. Wilhelm Wundt, Hermann von Helmholtz, how the ear hears, how the eye sees, how the sensory apparatus works, and so on. Um, and then in the, in, the, in the middle, in, the, in 1943, there was an important paper by the neurophysiologist Warren McCulloch and the mathematical logician Walter Pitts called On the Logic Imminent in Nerve Nets. And basically what this paper said is, let's take a model of a nerve, a, a brain cell, is simply a switch. And they have certain inputs and certain outputs. And there's a, um, you can have the afferent nerves, uh, can also have inhibitors on it. And you have a threshold. So if three of them are active, the cell will fire and send out signals along the afferent, the afferent lines attached to it. Now, as they said, this is a very simple model. And yet they were able to show that you could take that very simple model of the cell and you could draw networks of connections of cells that would do logic. That indeed would do logic to the same extent the human logic. That is, there is no logical conclusion, no logical consequence that you couldn't get this nerve net to perform. As I say, they thought of it as a very simple simplification. When John von Neumann, I have myself. When John von Neumann came across the first electronic, all electronic calculator, the ENIAC, at the University of Pennsylvania in 1945, he asked. How did, what's the logic of this machine? And then he got to, together with the people who had designed it, Jay Presper Eckert and um, John Mock, to add on to the machine the capacity of a stored program and also to be able to do internal logic. This would be the follow-on machine. And he wrote a report on the design of this new machine. It's called First Draft of the Report on the Headback Electronic Discrete Variable Automatic Calculator. Now, what is to me about that paper and later writings of von Neumann is when he saw that machine, what did he, what did he think of? What, what is it he saw in the machine? And the answer seems to be he saw a McCulloch Pitts nerve net. He said, this is a physical embodiment of that theoretical apparatus that McCulloch and Pitts design. And it can do all the logic that that nerve net can do. So we have a machine now that basically can carry out any process for which we can give clear, unambiguous instructions. So from, from not even from the beginning, the computer record, um, represented a form of organism, an artificial organism, he says in one of his writings. It's not surprising that one of his last works is on the computer and the brain. And you can see where this is headed. We have a new technology here. And that three pound machine in our heads has become a computer. 
And the limits of computation seem to be coextensive with the limits of what can be. So you need to think about nature as computation. It's coming, but it's built there into a mind's work. So we're back, we have reached the computer, and I'd like to talk about that as a culmination and as a transition point. Point of the new beginning. Culmination, because when the computer appeared as a practical device in the late 1940s and especially in the 50s, all of these activities which had been going on picked it up. In a sense, they knew what to do with this new possibility. Now, they did not constitute a demand to which it was an answer. They constituted a market which was ready to pick it up and to adapt their way of doing things to the new possibilities and limitations of the computer. And so the computer spread out through all of these activities Sciences, the new activities, uh, writing on social theories, statistics, what have you. The management people were just grabbed onto this machine and became management tool, and so on. For the scientists, at first, it represented um, a very needed tool. By the 1940s, the kinds of problems that John von Neumann was working on, especially in hydrodynamics, gas dynamics, the atomic bomb, what have you, had reached the limits of analytic mathematics. Couldn't solve the problems mathematically anymore in closed form. You got the equation, but there's no way to solve the equation except to start plugging numbers in at small energies. Calculate. And for Norman actually found the device in the University of Pennsylvania because he was going around the country looking for computational devices to carry out the calculations in. The Negro Bush never bothered to tell him about the machine at the University of Pennsylvania because Bush never thought it would work. Because it would require getting 18,000 vacuum tubes to work together for long enough to do anything. So, in a sense, you could say the computer comes along in the areas, of, at least of the physical sciences, in the nick of time. They're up against a standstill. They have these huge calculations. The calculations have to be done in some period of time short enough to actually be, generate useful results that you could then work with. There's no good if the calculations going to take two years. Oh, that can work. We'll try another two years on this one. But over the, the course of, or when the, once the computer had appeared, the device itself became more than just a calculator. I told you, Phenomenon thought about it as an artificial organism. And asked the thing, well, what, what is this machine? What is this machine? How does it work? What is it capable of? Is there a science? And over the course of the next, 20 or 30 years, a new science appears, computer science, science of computation, science of computing processes. Don't worry about the details here. This is meant for another lecture. The point I want to make is it starts off with a search for models of computation. That is, what is the computer like? It generates its own body of theory. And by the end of the 1960s, this body of theory is now becoming a resource for other people to think about how the world works. That is, they turn now to this new computer science for models of processes in the natural world. Right? One of the developments here is the notion of thinking about DNA as a code. So you have the the tape with the base acids on it, and you want to read that as a code. This is sort of the triumph of that older mechanical model, reductionist model. We're down now to big molecules. And the big molecules constitute base acids, and there's a sequence of base acids. 
change in a changing pattern, and those patterns correspond ultimately <coughs> one works out to genes. And the driving model, even though it's not in the end the determinant model, <coughs> driving model is that of computer code. It's decoding the sequence of uh, base assets on the DNA string. But here's, an, here's something that's unexpected. Here's where a biologist was wandering by a classroom where a computer science lecture was going on and noticed a description of the, of the what are called context-free grammars of Noam Chomsky, the linguist, which are fundamental to the understanding of formal languages and the developing of programming languages. And he looked at the patterns and he thought, that has something to do with the way plants grow. So here you have, in the work of Aristide Lindenmeyer, an L system in which this is a Chomsky formal grammar. And if you plug that in with certain additional semantics to give you leaves and branches, you get these plants. That is, computer science now becomes a model for how plants grow. And increasingly, in order to understand the complex processes of living organisms, one turns to the computer and to computer modeling. I stole this from somebody at EASF. We gave a talk and he had to borrow my machine to show his PowerPoint. <laughs> and he left it on my machine. But this is a slide from the presentation of the use of artificially intelligent machines to determine what super molecule, what large molecules might or might not be medically active. In which we get a picture of the world at a level that we can't possibly see it or touch it with any of the other means at our disposal, a representation of the world that may or may not look like that but serves as a representation. That, and the, and the, the validity of it, the usefulness of it, is really determined by whether the sorts of things, the, the way in which the, the representation behaves in the computer corresponds to behavior at a level that we can observe, i.e. is it medically active or isn't it? Do things hook on the way we want them or don't, or don't they? So increasingly now, in the realm of the bio, of, of, of the life sciences, but in, in almost every realm of science, we've run up against the limits of traditional mathematical and mechanical representation. So we turn now to simulations built or representations built in the computer, and we study the world in the computer. That's the only way we can get at it. In a sense, and, and so what we're coming out of this, their opinions are divided on this as to whether Steve Wolf or Miller does have a new kind of science. I, I adduce it only because at one extreme, we have here a statement that essentially nature is simply a series of computational processes. In that case, the simulations are, in a sense, nature, not just representation. For others, they remain representations. We begin increasingly now to think about the world in computational terms, as Thais tells us. You go with the amino acid project, you keep the silicon chip plan in reserve just in case. And you can find serious writers who want to argue look, life in silico is just as possible as life in carbon. Life is, you know. This guy's amazing. <laughs> a friend of mine is a theoretical biologist. When they announced the human genome was only 30, about 33,000 genes, they said, what now? They said, biologists are going to have to learn a lot of topology. Because <laughs> if it comes down now to how the whole thing gets folded, 
Because the problem is, you can get the gene laid out, you know what the sequences are, but when that is sitting in a cell, why does that cell grow into a fingernail? Why does that cell grow into an eye cell? Why does that cell grow into something else? How are these genes expressed? What is the mechanism? And we can't get at that. We don't really. And we can't get at it in any other way but to try to model it in the computer, not by taking it apart anymore. It's a complex phenomenon. We, we don't, if we resolve it down to the basic elements, we don't know how to put them back together again. Let me get in, in this is my conclusion. point. I'm going to skip this. This is the traditional reductionist hierarchy. This is the world the way the physicists would have it. <laughs> of course, I've left out one group, the mathematicians, and they sit right at the top, terrorizing everything. <laughs> The idea is, going back to the 17th century, physics tells you how the very basic particles work. So physics gets you from electrons and protons and even smaller particles up to atoms and very small molecules. And then they turn things over to the chemists. Or rather, chemists pick up from there. And they handle the larger molecules all the way up to the really large molecules that then get handed off to the biologists. And they take those very large molecules and up through cells until they get to organisms, and they hand off to the ecologists who then worry about how those organisms fit into a larger system. I say reductionist because, in theory, each higher level can explain the lower level. Each lower level is reducible to the terms of the higher level. So the ecologists are dependent on the biologists, and the biologists are dependent on the chemists, and the chemists are de dependent on the physicists, and we won't say the physicists are dependent on <laughs> That's the reductionist hierarchy. But there's a problem with that. You see, at those lines, those transitions are opaque. Maybe physicists can explain the helium atom from physical equations. But let's talk about some of the other areas. How do you, what's the phys, what are the physical equations that give you two molecules of hydrogen and a molecule of oxygen and you get a tasteless fluid out of two gases? No physical equations. In principle, chemistry is reducing the physics. In fact, no one knows how to do it. Just as in principle, biology is reducible to chemistry, except no one knows how you get from large molecules to biologically active large molecules. Some, there's a transition there, and it seems to have something to do with complexity of organization. It's not in the elements themselves, it's in the way the elements are put together. And you get them tied together, and they do things that you would not and cannot predict in the constituents. And because that reductionist hierarchy breaks up, We have no way of moving from one realm to the other. We're trying to explain how molecules become chemically active, or how atoms in various complexes become chemically active, the kinds of activity, how large molecules become biologically active, and so on. And we have no way of getting at it in the traditional means of taking it apart down to the elements and putting the elements back together, because we don't have it. So what do we do? We turn to the computer. And we try to simulate it. That is, we try to construct, synthesize, out of some kind of representation of what's going on, a system that behaves the way in which the target system behaves, as a way of, of gaining some kind of sense of what's going on, some kind of um, way of dealing with it. And then we play with the model to see if we can get the model to do certain things, and if those the way we make the model do certain things somehow correspond to manipulations in the laboratory to get the same things happening, we think we've got to understand it. But we're in a double blind here. Because we're using a representation that in most cases has no identifiable relationship to what it is we're modeling. Because the basic elements of the model don't have any correspondence in the basic elements of the phenomenon. 
and what's more, we turned it over to the computer. And guess what? The computer is a phenomenon as complex as any natural phenomenon. We just don't know what's going on in the computer. We can't follow the process. So that old idea that you model the world as a mechanical system using mathematical equations, and then you solve those equations and you watch the solution coming out, you have that sense, I know how this works. You put a simulation in the computer, the computer runs, look at the result. That's amazing. I have a famous idea. <laughs> And so, whereas at the beginning, Francis Bacon said, look, nature should be commanded, must be obeyed. Truth and utility are one same thing. That is, knowledge of the world, understanding of the world is tied to control of the world. We see now, with this latest turn in uh, the scientific tradition, to be in a situation where we have operative control. The EASF may not know how those models work, but they know how to produce medically active drugs. It works as a tool to get practical results, but it doesn't bring much understanding of what it is that makes one large molecule medically active and another not. And so, to change the hierarchy, picking up on a theoretical biologist named Robert Rosen, one of the more interesting people to write on the subject in the last half of the 20th century. Instead of the hierarchy, we've got another situation which inverts things. That is, in the 17th century, we were lucky enough to focus on that small range of problems in the world that are amenable to mathematical mechanical solution. And we focused on them. We had immense success. But in fact, it is just a small subset of the vast living world of complex processes that are not amenable to those techniques. And so far, our only way into those, um, into those processes is by computer um, programs. And it, as I said, it, it provided a new perspective. This is a discussion I had just last week at the conference. To the extent that now science is software, Science is computer programs. The notion of the scientific method by which one could look at one's description of the method by which he or she arrived at the result being reported in this paper is no longer accessible to us. It's a computer program. And the person who wrote the computer program can no more tell you how that program works than the person who's using it. So I, th I don't know what the scientists are going to do with this. But I know the historians of science in 50 years are going to be in a hell of a bind because they're going to have no original sources. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, do the comments that, that you shared with us today have any implications for the model that most universities that have an engineering school separate from the little art schools where they teach the sciences. Yeah, it does. It means that they're going increasingly to be um, joined together. More importantly than that, what's going to happen is that the sciences themselves are going to have to talk interdisciplinarily. Mm -hmm. The only way we're going to get at this is when Students learn the mathematics and the physics and the biology and the in some kind of interdisciplinary system. So we, I mean, like things like biomedical engineering is the beginning of that kind of thing? <laughs> More so than ever, it's going to be a question of learning by doing, including theoretical and such. Or so it seems to me. I'm just doing it. I'm a lousy problem. <laughs> Sir, you said that Leibniz invented the first computing machine that could add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Mm -hmm. How about the abacus? Automatic. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so the see it's Leibniz. Yeah, but in the abacus, all the abacus is doing is recording results that you're doing in your head. Well, it's an, isn't it an analog computer? Actually, it's a digital computer. 
the county. Well, yeah, except it, it's limited by size, so to speak. It's limited by size, but basically what you're doing is you're laying down beads, right. or you can just lay stones down on a, on a board. So you're doing the arithmetic, you're doing it digit by digit. The abacus is keeping them the record of what you're doing, and then occasionally you have to regroup. That's the human that sees that. In the case of Leibniz, you put in the multiplier, you put in the multiple can, you turn the handle. So, Why do you think, sir, get, given all this tremendous capacity and potential we, we have here in this world, that we're having such a difficult time developing economic and social alternatives to fossil fuels. <laughs> That's Tom Friedman. <laughs> no, I, I, look, I take your point. Um, it has nothing to do with any expertise I have. It's, it's a failure of will. Because we could do it if we wanted to as a society. We just don't want to. The price of gas has something to do with that. I was in Germany last week. Try seven dollars a gallon and see what that does to your driving habits. Kind of car you drive. We're nowhere near that. Gas now is cheaper than it was in the seventies. In terms of its of its real dollar. Sir. You stated that uh Computer programmers write the programs, but they don't necessarily know what the output's going to look like. Um, theoretically, they know how to create a number of alternatives that using the logic comes up with some result. Is artificial intelligence kind of the next step in creating additional programs, coming up with additional results? There's a school of researchers that are trying to go at it that way. They've been trying to go at it that way for the last 50 odd years. Uh, yeah, it's just one definition of artificial intelligence. Um, the artificial intelligence people will complain that every time they succeed in one of their goals, it becomes computer engineering. <laughs> <laughs> and they never get credit for it. And think about it computer you use, there'd be any number of places where what was a research area in artificial intelligence is at work in the program. The one that corrects your spelling, the one that guesses what the next word is going to be, um, all kinds of things like that. Um, a lot of pattern recognition. These are, these are all research areas. Let me get back to the first point. This is a, a long and big subject. Everyone who's ever programmed a computer has had the experience of being absolutely sure that this program is the program that you meant to write. And you put it in the computer and it doesn't run. Or it doesn't produce the results. Or what's worse, it produces results and you don't know whether they're right. It doesn't even crash. <laughs> okay. And that can have serious problems. When people die, because of the unintended consequences of computer programming, whose programmers thought they knew what they were doing. And part of the problem is, that has been pointed out by one of the leading figures in the field called artificial life is that we have no way of taking the text of a program, a static statement with the steps it's going to follow, and predicting from that what will happen when that becomes a dynamic process. We can't trace the values through. And what's more, Unlike Newton's equations for the planets, we can't pick a point far out in the distance and predict where the planet's going to be. Let's plug in 1,032 years into the equation. That's where the planet's going to be. You, you can't get at computer programs that way. The only way you can do it, follow them, is follow them state by state by state. You don't have a general equation. That's what I meant when I said programmers can't entirely explain it. What's going on? And so when you get a computer program that actually does something you didn't intend it to, it to do, some artificial intelligence people will say, aha, you see, that's an emergent property. Or is it a bug in the program? Or, well, <laughs> for Microsoft, it's an undocumented feature. 